Hello and welcome to Watchmaking. Here is Ines and Lisa. This is the podcast about watchmaking that you've never heard before. We're going to take you on an exciting journey into the heart of timepieces. And our experts and guests will offer an exclusive insider's views, forecasts and predictions on the industry. From the intricacies of watchmaking to its far-reaching implications across different domains, watchmaking is your go-to destination. So enjoy and uh, viva, viva watchmaking! watchmaking. So welcome. Uh, today's guest is a master of wit and words, and he's also the founder of Watches TV. It is Marc André Deschaux. Welcome. Thank you for having me. As a first guest, <laughs> that amuses me to be on the other side, especially on his own channel. But that's fine, and it's going in the right direction in terms of where we want to go. So, um, first question, maybe to start. Uh, we know you as the founder of Watches TV, as I said, but. Who is mad, Marc-André Deschamps? Well, I'm a little uh, Swiss dude, uh, been born in Geneva, stayed most of my life uh, around here, always liked uh, watchmaking, and uh, did part of my studies here, partly in England, uh, but I studied at university mm -hmm. in uh, political science, I have a, political, uh, a master's degree in political science, and then I started my uh, career as just like a very formal and... Uh, can surprise a few people, but as a business consultant for one of those big, uh, large consulting firm. And uh, then, but I always had like an entrepreneurial spirit and uh, always wanted to have uh, my own uh, stuff. And uh, I did that even when I was a student. So it's kind of just a, a logical way of moving on. You had a lot of things uh, in your past and I you know that you have a pilot license as well. Uh, how does all this combine? It was the passion as well? Absolutely, and everything that's got to do with the sense of how to be as free as possible. Obviously, I like that, and uh, being able to fly and going wherever you want to go is obviously something that uh, satisfies me a lot. I should say satisfied me a lot because I haven't flown for quite a while. And you're also a passionate golf player? Absolutely. I like it. This is my little sauna exercise because, uh, not sauna exercise, but yoga exercise. Sauna is also pretty nice. No, but it's more like yoga. Because cardio. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, it's just a way of, uh, of staying focused, not thinking about everything else. Uh, if you do something bad, you need to recover. Don't get excited. Don't get nervous. Just, you know, calm down and go on. But it's interesting that with all these passions, you kind of represent the watchmaking culture. Well, that was very, uh, wasn't thought like this and just, uh, just, just the way it is, yeah. Has it all led your way to, uh, to become a, a passionate uh, watch lover and uh, to create uh, the Watches TV? Um, well, not necessarily, um, but... Um, I mean, there's obviously parallels between all these different worlds. And uh, so there's, again, some kind of uh, lo logic behind, even though it wasn't made in that purpose. It just happened. It's uh, like uh, life and it surprises. Yeah, and actually, we would usually think aviation and watches are very closely linked. But you actually shared a story which did not really reflect that uh, regarding uh, in the past a moment where you, uh, you, you wanted to have a collaboration with the brand. Um, so yeah, could you maybe share this uh, an, an, an anecdote? Yeah, well, that was kind of a little uh, first, uh, how do you say, contact with a uh, little, little disillusion, I would say, around this, uh, this world, because indeed I had created uh, an online pilot logbook for both uh, American and European pilots. So I thought that it would be easy to find a collaboration and partnership with a watch brand that uh, makes its slogan, you know, just a very, I mean, instrument for professionals. I guess people know who I'm talking about. And uh, when we tried to do this collaboration, then unfortunately that didn't happen because they said that, well, finally, they were not selling that many watches to the pilot community, so they didn't really care. So that was kind of a big surprise for me. Uh, like I said, uh, kind of a disillusion. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, one experience that in a certain way just for me highlighted more 
that there's a, so much marketing in this industry compared to probably the true essence of what uh, watchmaking is all about. Do you regret uh, never making this project alive? No, because I mean, I, I did it. The thing that I regret is to having stopped it. And that was kind of still as of today, probably the biggest regret I have in my life because the idea was uh, actually pretty good. And we're talking more than 20 years ago and it was already working through a phone for instance so it was just like quite uh, innovative uh, for sure and um, yeah just um, unfortunately well one disillusion after the other just kind of made it all tumble down unfortunately and uh, like I said still a kind of a regret but that's life you know you move on. And talking about moving on uh, we know that you have have had and have many projects. Recently, you've started a very important project, and uh, which I think you've thought about for quite a long time. So could you tell us? Yeah, well, when I started Watches TV, from the start, from the get-go, more or less, I wanted to do like uh, what we call a, like a video glossary of uh, the skills and the different aspects, dimensions of this uh, of this industry, and never managed to, to do it. But it's something that indeed was... From, from from the from the start something that was uh, very uh, important for me and in a certain way I'm glad that I didn't make it happen because uh, 10 years later it enabled me to understand better uh, obviously this industry the needs the requirements the challenges uh, so to put together a project that is really solely focused on uh, education sharing uh, knowledge uh, maintaining documenting savoir-faire know-how is obviously something that is very important and very dear to me and a way of uh, giving back to this uh, marvelous industry uh, something that hopefully will be useful for today's generation and future ones. Quite an ambitious project, right? Yeah, and that's the reason why also, I mean, now, I mean, we're talking about the Horopedia project, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a foundation and uh, I think that indeed the fact of having gone through those 10 years just enabled me to come to this, let's say, wise decision of separating this project from uh, the activity of uh, Watches TV. It's something that sh is, shouldn't, I mean, doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to the community, ba basically. And uh, so it just, you know, leaves out all the uh, commercial talks that people can have around this and just to really focus on uh, education and sharing it. So guys, if you want to learn more about the Oropedia project, you can go to the website oropedia.org and find all the videos uh, and there are more coming soon. But uh, I want to come back to the other project that you have uh, and it's Watches TV. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, hear how it all started. Like, you know, what bring you to, uh, to the idea of creating the video channel, YouTube channel, uh, about watchmaking? I've always liked mechanical objects and watches uh, in uh, particular. Sounds maybe a bit like a, a dude thing. But like I said, I started my career as a, a business consultant. And this led me a bit more than, well, 20 years ago to uh, manage a little group of uh, suppliers of the watchmaking industry. And we were involved in many different fields. I mean, we did all the 3D movies at the time. Uh, of course, of the of the of the industry, but we did also engineering. We did the private label activity, design, communication, and it this gave me a very good understanding, a transversal understanding of the industry. So not only talking about uh, communication uh, issues, of course, but also production issues and, uh, like I said, engineering uh, issues. And so that was really uh, interesting. But um, after a few uh, years of, uh, with this activity, a couple of years actually, uh, then I set up something that I've always wanted to do, meaning it was to set up a proper uh, production company here in uh, Geneva, uh, catering to the television, to the cinema world, to uh, advertising agencies, uh, organ international organizations and so forth. And uh, we set up a really strong kind of one-stop shop of uh, audiovisual uh, Uh, services uh, in within the same um, yeah well within the same uh, building and uh, so I was a partner there CEO of that uh, company for seven years and this enabled me to uh, get really seriously acquainted with the world of uh, audiovisual production 
And we did a few movies, obviously, for some of the big brands here, and some of these movies were costing quite a lot of money. And I said, okay, well, actually, who is who are the, who is looking at, at those movies? And I was really convinced that the price paid for those movies was really, you know, making, in terms of communication, that it was really as pertinent as possible. I mean, oh, I understand the idea of pleasing yourself and producing a very nice movie, but the... the the cost versus uh, result uh, equation can be obviously a little bit uh, questionable. So I thought there was another way of talking about and giving visibility to watchmakers uh, by treating their uh, newsworthy activity in a in a different uh, in a different way, not as a corporate way of looking at it, but bringing some uh, kind of an editorial uh, dimension to it, but through video. I mean, I come through video, so I kind of combine both sets of skills, my understanding of the industry, plus my understanding of audiovisual pro production, to uh, merge this, those two and f start a new company, Watches TV. I mean, it's obviously a very niche, but uh, we started almost 13 years ago, and uh, we were the first ones uh, to do that. At the time, people said, oh, what, uh, what is he doing? I mean, uh, that's not going to last very long. Uh, but I knew that the power of the image, the power of the video, would supplant uh, probably text, another way of uh, talking about uh, watch watches. It's not that one is better than the other, it's just that it's part of evolution and to be able to see things, see people talk, see how they are, how, how they react, obviously see, see the action is something that I thought was probably uh, more uh, interesting. So yeah, we were pioneers in terms of uh, talking of this industry through the video channel uh, only. Uh, but initially I wasn't, uh, I didn't expect to be I mean, the role that I have today, I didn't expect to be in front of the camera for the for so for the first two years, basically. I mean, I was really kind of behind. I already had kind of a, a small team with me, but uh, I didn't uh, appear. And after a while, it seemed that uh, some people within the industry didn't necessarily want to be in front of a camera, but they still had some interesting things to say. So I said, OK, well, maybe it's time for me to tell the, these stories uh, for the for these guys. And uh, that's how uh, very timidly I started appearing. And from then on, then, well, uh, got a little bit, probably a bit more comfortable with my role. And uh, here we are. But you, obviously things have evolved since we started this in 2011. Yeah, yeah but it's interesting that you mentioned that the uh, industry at first, uh, they didn't appreciate, uh, you know, having this uh, media channel and uh, being exposed uh, to the world? Well, it's an industry that likes to be in control. Uh, so when you produce your own movie, obviously you say the message, uh, you, you, you give the message that you really want to, uh, to, to, to give. Even within the, the press, I mean, there is also kind of some kind of, of control there. Uh, talking about books, obviously there's also some kind of control. And uh, so it was kind of a new thing and people didn't really know exactly uh, how to, to handle it. And then on top of it, I mean, you, with video, you can't cheat. Uh, is, uh, you, you really see what's going on. Uh, I mean, with the written text, you can always, you know, add words if they're missing. You can correct things. Uh, you can... Uh, arrange uh, the, the messages or so forth even after uh, for instance interviews have been done whether well whereas with video it's that's the way it is you know just we just capture the truth basically so i understand the risk in a certain way that some people didn't want to take meaning being indeed in front of the camera and leaving a trace uh, that maybe wouldn't satisfy exactly what these guys wanted to say or how they wanted to say it and there aren't that many people in the industry uh, at least at the time that were very me media friendly yeah uh, and indeed to have a camera uh, stuck onto you is not necessarily something very normal it's just like jumping out of a plane with a parachute i don't think we were necessarily meant to do that and uh, um, so today i think it's part of the responsibility of managers and so forth also to have a bit more of a media friendly uh, capacities it's it's uh, it, it has to be, yeah, it's part of the job, basically. So there are more people today that are able to, to talk, but 
regardless, I mean, <laughs> I mean, in this in this industry, uh, you have a few really good storytellers, uh, and they stand out, and generally they're pretty successful. So yeah, indeed, I mean, watchmaking has a lot to do with the how the way you tell the story. Uh, the product is one thing, but being able to like I said, tell the story around it is uh, has become extremely important. And regarding the way of telling stories, do you feel sometimes that there are some terms that are overused, misused for uh, communication reasons? Um, of course. Uh, I, uh, for instance, I, I hate this word DNA. I understand what it means, okay? And it, it just illustrates quite well uh, what it's supposed to say. But when I hear it, I always feel like it's like kind of sometimes some kind of marketing uh, garbage almost. Uh, also, disruptive is something that I think is over, uh, I mean, used or valued. Um, We're still talking about watchmaking and how disruptive can you be about talking about the mechanical object. So yeah, there's a, some of those buzzwords that uh, sometimes annoys me a, li a little bit. And maybe regarding sports watches, do you feel like there is this uh, this aspect of overused, misused world? No, because it's uh, it reflects uh, demand from the market, and we've seen that. I mean, the most successful watches of the last, uh, let's say, 10 years have mainly been sport watches. Uh, and uh, I mean, look at the success of the crown. It's a sport watch. It's a tool watch, but it's a sports watch. Uh, and it's uh, easier to uh, appeal to a larger audience, a consumer audience, uh, coming with uh, sports watches. And we've seen even classical brands or independent brands that today have taken also down that route uh, to satisfy uh, or to, let's say, make their uh, speech a little bit more understandable by a, a wider audience again. Um, we talked about sports watch and maybe we can unleash uh, fortune telling cookies and talk about the 2024 trends. We have several categories here and we would like to hear some professional forecasts for 2024. So what would they be? Uh, well, there are two different trends. There's one, there's a, I would say like a general business trend where 2024 will obviously be a little bit more complicated and we've already seen signs of this, already dating from one year, but now things have just become more obvious for, uh, for everyone. Uh, but so um, in terms of kind of general trend, and, but we've talked about this already a few, a little bit uh, before, um, it's just like you know, watches are obviously becoming smaller, slimmer, uh, sometimes more uh, sober uh, uh, also. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, so the size is, uh, is one thing. Uh, but I think the, coming back to the, the business side of thing, we, we, we're going into uh, more uh, darker, let's say, uh, phase. But watchmaking has always been cyclical. You know, there's ups and downs, and uh, now we're on a down. Let's we have, we have to remember that those last three years have been very unusual, and uh, we can't take them really as reality. So. Uh, You know, so those that were cautious, those that have anticipated this slowdown, I think, will be fine. And some others might, uh, well, it, uh, the, the, the welcome back to reality might be a little bit more complicated for some. So the darker phase uh, will be for watchmakers or the, for, for communication teams? Uh, for watchmakers, ultimately, uh, for the brands themselves, you know, it's, uh, um, I mean, it's, It's always a complicated equation. You have a strong demand, so you increase your production capabilities, and then when you have a slowdown, uh, or you increase your prices, uh, for instance. And with that, this is something we've, of, of course, uh, seen quite a lot. Uh, and then, uh, well, when things start to change, the market dynamics start to change, to adapt your pricing strategy becomes very complicated. How can you say that, okay, my watch was costing 20, and oh, now it's, things are doing not so well. So the same watch, uh, You can't price it down at 15. Uh, I mean, uh, that means that you did something wrong towards the consumers that bought it at 20. So uh, you're a little bit in a catch-22 situation. So it's for those who've exaggerated too much, then it might be a little bit more uh, complicated, I would say. Do you think that uh, it will be a bad, kind of bad year for uh, retailers in that sense? 
I mean, we've already seen some very clear signs of that, of course. Um, the thing that we haven't really seen, but we hear about, is that the level of stocks uh, out there are pretty high. And uh, with this, then that means that maybe some, a few people, a few retailers, because they don't have the choice, they also have to pay their bills. But uh, when they're a little bit stuck, then they will be able to, um, well, take unfortunate decisions, slash a few prices here and there, and this kind of shatters the entire, um, I mean, way of how brands should uh, should work, operate, uh, create this uh, <coughs> trustworthy relation with their retailers. Um, so, I mean, something that have o has always been very complicated and which was always a big threat with the industry is indeed <coughs> people uh, doing all those, uh, for instance, rebates and things like that. And then now consumers are less, I mean, they go and hunt for prices, uh, uh, basically. So when you have options to hunt, well, then you hunt. But if everybody plays the game and, you know, nobody gives rebates and things like that, then it kind of makes the, the, the market a little bit more sane, I would say. And uh, today we could be at you know, a new phase of a redeveloping gray market, for instance, because people just have to sell some of the, these watches. But a lot of efforts have been done over the well five years to, uh, to make this uh, as healthy as possible. So it would be kind of a drawback to go back to what the situation maybe was like eight or ten years ago. It's been a while now that uh, people are talking that uh, those who collect watches, they um, they became more knowledgeable, younger. Do you think these uh, could have an impact also on the, the situation on the market? Yes and no, uh, because indeed there is for sure a higher level of education, which explains uh, partly, but I mean it's, it's important uh, explanation of why the independent scene has become Uh, so much hotter over the last few years because people said, okay, well, first of all, maybe I don't want to have the same watch as my neighbor. Uh, I want to be a little bit more uh, original, but also because they understand better what's inside the product and what's the investments made uh, by uh, some of these brands compared to like a more marketing approach where you just buy a, a watch because of the, 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 the brand uh, power. So it's a, it's kind of a mix uh, uh, of the two. Um, so I think indeed the, the 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 independents, I mean, they're hot. They will should remain hot. Uh, but ultimately, we're not talking that many watches in the grand scheme of things. I mean, Switzerland we produce like 13 million uh, make, uh, uh, watches um, last year. Oh, I mean, those are the 2022 uh, uh, numbers, but we shouldn't be far off. And so the, the, those, okay, high added value uh, watches represents a very small fraction of uh, uh, all this. So I don't think uh, the change of situation will change too much things for, for these guys. A part that we've already seen, uh, we've already heard signs of, uh, for instance, you know, consumer that uh, collectors that had placed orders that now are just... <coughs> just uh, you know say well let's be more in a wait and see uh, situation no, waiting list yeah this has uh, has changed i mean Which it's list? easy to put yourself on a waiting list okay but then when you really have to say okay well now you need to purchase it uh, well then uh, some some of these guys say well i'll uh, i'll i'll back down and uh, wait my turn and please give it to somebody else uh, so so i mean that that is a reality So last year and at the beginning of this year, we've seen some important buy uh, buyouts. Yeah, the acqu acquisitions of all the mm -hmm. um, all the brands, like more of the names of the brands. Uh, sometimes, uh, like with uh, we can say names. I think Breitling uh, bought Universal mm -hmm. Geneve. They bought the whole company. The question is, like you know, what are your expectations? What are your anticipated revival of a watch brand? I mean, the most uh, expected one, the most uh, waited for is, of course, uh, what happened rather recently with the acquisition of uh, Universal Genève by, uh, by Breitling. This is a brand that has a lot of, uh, I mean, benefits from a lot of sympathy from uh, collectors. But those are watches that were, you know, you could buy them, the, the old school uh, Universal watches. Uh, those three compacts, Conorov and so forth, you could buy it for, I mean, 
a reasonable uh, uh, price. Uh, and people, you know, they're okay to spend two, three, four thousand Swiss francs on some of these uh, vintage watches. Will they be willing uh, to pay eight, ten, fifteen for the re revived, revived uh, Universal? That uh, uh, I don't know. So they have to create uh, probably another market uh, for this, of, uh, a new uh, collector seg um, consumer segment for, 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 for these guys. But with the, their. Uh, I mean, with the know-how of the Breitling team, I'm pretty sure that they will succeed. But it's going to be an interesting one. I think I mean, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, we're all uh, eager to see what will come out of, uh, of that one. But the fact of uh, relaunching brands is something that we've seen, I mean, year after year. Uh, everybody tries and uh, uh, there's not that many success. This time, I think they, they, it's probably one of the, yeah, this is, this is probably something that will, uh, the, that will work. I think, based on the, 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 the capacity of the team of making it happen. I think this is, I mean, again, we come back always to the notion of people and uh, with the right people and the right expertise, then you can do things. And of course, a bit of means, uh, then you're capable of, uh, of uh, doing things. And it's interesting that they put it as a, in a segment of high luxury watches. But well, it, it is anticipated at least to be a high luxury segment. Yeah, but uh, it, it makes sense. I think, you know, Breitling tried to up their game for a, for a while. It, it, they, of course, sold a few of these uh, watches, but this is not how you associate uh, Breitling with. Uh, so um, with Universal, that enables them to uh, indeed position that at, uh, in a higher uh, segment, more niche, of course, uh, but uh, it's, uh, for me, it makes sense. And not regarding revivals, but maybe uh, brands which are established, which one would you hope or expect to see grow this year? Well, the, the, the thing I expect or hope the most is that, I mean, growth is one thing, but, you know, just uh, decline. Uh, if we can avoid that, then that, that would be already pretty good, especially in today's context. Uh, and uh, so I just hope that there's not going to be like, Uh, an erosion of uh, envy uh, by uh, consumers towards watchmaking as a whole saying okay well okay this was all fun over the last few years but now okay let's I've had a, we've had enough let's uh, let's move on and let's buy other things i mean in other words, for instance lvmh as a luxury conglomerate is uh, is going to have a record year in uh, 2023 uh, but on the other hand regarding the watchmaking uh, industry or its division it's uh, it's growing a little bit but not as much as the rest so it just shows that consumers are maybe more willing to buy a bag or a perfume or clothes or thing like that uh, than uh, than watches so the threat is if watches are not perceived any longer as something cool Uh, then we could have a little issue. I'm not too worried, okay? Let's 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 be honest. But you know, the industry as a whole will still be uh, uh, okay. Um, it, there might be just some adaptations, uh, well, some needed adaptations to this uh, new reality. Kind of rebranding of watches. Well, you have world. to maintain the hype around them. A lot of the hype over the last uh, few, well, couple of years has been linked with uh, the notion of being able to speculate uh, on some of these watches uh, so people that were buying them were not necessarily doing so for the love of watches uh, just seeing more the opportunities that uh, came with them so we're probably you know getting rid or got rid of uh, this, uh, this this part of the of the market uh, so you know you need to have people that are really truly inspired uh, by uh, continuing their interest in uh, in watches and obviously buy them at one point or another. Why do you think people will start losing their interest in watches? Is it related to uh, the appearance of smart watches that's, or, uh, you know, your personal uh, phones uh, when you don't need to look at time? Or the uh, price point? Or the price point? Mm -hmm. well, What is the biggest uh, impact? Uh, It's a, a combination of, uh, of things. I mean, as long as the watch, I mean, the functional reason of a watch has, is since a long time kind of gone, of 
course. I mean, even people that are wearing a watch, they will also just often look at the time on their telephone instead of looking at their wrist. I mean, I've witnessed that so many times. It became uh, a jewelry piece in, in a way. Yeah, so it's a, indeed more of a jewelry piece. It's more of a, uh, it's also, it has this uh, status uh, symbol dimension that is, of course, uh, extremely uh, important and uh, has to remain so. But to remain as a status object, people need to understand what it is. Uh, so going back to this notion of uh, 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 education. And this I'm talking as, as an industry as a whole, okay? And not necessarily the niche uh, products or brands. Um, so yeah, this could, uh, this could have a, a, a little impact. Maybe now, uh, you know, this is also an argument we've he been hearing for quite a while, but uh, an ob a watch is of course some, is a sustainable object because you don't have to replace the battery, it has no obsolescence uh, if it's well serviced. But mechanical watches are mechanical sustainable. Watches. Yeah, exactly. So this is something that indeed could be uh, kind of an argument uh, used. It's, I don't think it's going to be the main uh, driver, but at least it has this capacity of uh, playing on that field uh, also. Um, and but I think you know this watch is indeed a nice uh, symbol. I always thought that it was like a, a nice uh, way of having on your wrist uh, a link between our past, our present, and our future. In an ever more digital world, having an analog product on your wrist, I think, is uh, still pretty cool. But coming back to the functional reason. Uh, now with uh, smartwatches that monitor your health and st so forth, well, these you're bringing back functionality on the on the wrist uh, and creating uh, new habits, and people can get simply hooked on that. Uh, so once you start monitoring your uh, your health uh, after a few months, if you stop doing it, then you say, "Oh my God, something is going to happen to me." There's a strong uh, psychological dimension to uh, getting people addicted basically to those uh, devices, not watches, but electronic mm -hmm. devices, but it's taking place uh, on your wrist. So we only have two. And uh, I'm still not totally convinced of mm -hmm. people having a smart watch on one side and a mechanical watch on the other side. Uh, we've seen it. I mean, I've seen it very, very, uh, rarely uh, to, 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 to be honest and even I mean Sears collectors I mean we see them also wearing their uh, smartwatch Apple watch and thing like that and not wearing something else on the other mm -hmm. side and then you will wear your proper watch uh, for special uh, uh, occasions um, because some of these guys they like also to have simply the functionality and the convenience of uh, some of these uh, devices uh, on your wrist. And it's interesting that some of the brands now are using this marketing campaigns of, uh, you know, showing people wearing watches uh, not only on, on the wrist but on ankles or on as a collar, and uh, it's it's an interesting trend as well. Uh, the human nice body thing. has limits of wearing yeah. watches. I think the but places uh, where you can wear. It watches. shows that again the, the the you were mentioning about the, the kind of the jewelry uh, uh, aspect of it. Um, and okay, well, that's an illustration. But I mean, it, this is very marginal, and I kind of see whom you're talking uh, about. Uh, but yeah. But anyway, it's it's a way to present uh, how you can wear your watch and, and uh, wear this uh, smart tool, like your own mm -hmm. smart watch at the same time. Yeah, I'm not sure if it makes total sense. Though. Yeah, yeah, but this uh, this smart watches they're actually lacking uh, identity or status, which is one important aspects of the mechanical watches or quartz watches even yeah the, but so i mean you do I don't, I, again i mean you don't buy them for that i think you buy them for the functionality but the thing is that all these uh, devices like all the other electronic devices uh, we all see that they become um, obsolete rather rapidly um, and it's but overall i mean the, the, the number of uh, smartwatches sold, I mean, it just goes, surpasses immensely uh, the world of uh, mechanical watches. I mean, it's just uh, incredible. And it's what's funny or sad at the same time, it's like 10 years ago, uh, people uh, within the industry that just refused to acknowledge that this could represent a threat. Uh, and so it demonstrated a lack of vision, I would say. 
because it was this is just inevitable so of course i mean that's a that's a threat the fact of uh, sometimes today that you you become i mean you become a target and with all this looting going around and i mean wearing a watch should be all about pleasure and uh, if you take away that dimension of pleasure because you feel oh my god where am i walking this is going to be um, um, is something going to happen thing like that then you're making your life complicated and no one wants to make their life unnecessarily complicated so that's also a, a, a small th threat i would say yeah so the importance of pleasure and pleasure of wearing a watch pleasure of walking with the watch and not focus on um practicity and uh, yeah and yeah i mean the, the the notion of pleasure is the one that you for me is the common denominator of the uh, entire watch ecosystem from the people that design create to the ultimately to the person that wears it you know it's just uh, you buy a watch because you want to please yourself uh, not to make your life complicated yeah but what do you think uh, what do you feel is missing in the watchmaking world now complicated to answer this uh, this question a lot um, of layers underneath. Yeah. And or maybe a subject which is not discussed enough. Again, also, I mean, complicated. Everyone does their best efforts. But in, in terms of uh, making watches uh, more uh, interesting for people, what does brands lack, you know, when they present uh, the watches, new watches, or uh, not only brands, but, uh, you know, retailers as well? Um, what do you think is lacking, like, you know, is missing in this... Uh, in this chain? I don't have a clear answer to that, to be honest. Uh, uh, I understand that, you know, you, you need to market your products, make them uh, create some appeal to them. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes some of those uh, speeches are a little bit, a bit way too much, I would say, you know, the, uh, so missing out a little bit on authentic authenticity. But on the business standpoint, I understand why it's, it's, uh, it, uh, it this exists. Uh, the only thing, and we mentioned it a little bit before, consumers are obviously more educated today. I mean, there's so much resources out there. There's a lot of people are digging, they are uh, looking out for things. So it's it's more complicated for, for brands to say complete BS around uh, their way or their products or their way of doing it. Uh, com uh, compared to maybe 10 years ago. Uh, so if you played that game too much, then it could be a, a, a risky game. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's just, but in terms of products, what I see is that it's just like with the world of cars. I mean, watches have become more reliable. Uh, they are, there's still a lot of, even though we've kind of invented already everything, but that this this notion of already of still pushing to make your products better overall uh, the overall quality uh, whether it's m the movement and its precision for instance the sturdiness uh, the fact of not uh, cutting corners uh, doing things as generally as possible i think all this is uh, is is vital and not taking the consumer for a fool so uh, yeah the, i would say the there's this kind of a fine line between your business uh, requirements, business needs, and uh, be as true as possible at the same time. And like the, the audiovisual sector in this industry is very important to rely those informations. And we've seen that you've been in this industry for quite a while. Um, maybe could you tell us how this part of the industry changed? Maybe the positive uh, aspects or the less progressive points you've uh, seen over the years? Well, before you had uh, a brand that would uh, you know send out a, a, a message and people abided to it or not uh, but it was much more kind of a top down type of uh, of communication uh, and now you have many many peripheral actors or influencers that uh, precisely uh, have an influence on the market uh, dynamics. So it's a much more uh, 
atomized. I don't know if you say that in English, but it's much more. It's yeah, there are many more sources of uh, messages, sometimes conflicting, of course. Uh, again, when we started uh, Watches TV, when I started this, I mean, we were basically the the, only, the first ones and the only ones uh, using uh, video. And now you see that in the world of uh, social media, the number of people that are actually doing a little bit what we do, um, it's, it's just uh, phenomenal. I mean, we're talking you know, this, this like thousands and thousands <laughs> basically of, of people trying to uh, express uh, their views, uh, some with success, some a little bit more confidential, let's put it that way. So it's, um, it's yeah, the, 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 the access to information, whether pertinent or not, uh, has definitely changed the, the, the rule of the game. Do you find it uh, kind of intimidating in a way uh, that uh, people without the, the basis knowledge, maybe sometimes uh, just people who are passionate about watches, talk about watches? But I mean, it reflects the, the market also, uh, meaning that uh, out, of, you know, this, out of the people that are buying watches, I mean, the huge majority, they just buy the watch because they, they like it, they find it, it's cool, it looks nice. And that's enough for them. You know, I'm convinced that people that are buying Ferraris, most of them, they don't know what engine is inside. It's just, it's a cool product. That's all. So it's, uh, so, so, so that's the, 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 the reality. But now the, the thing is that when you have like a, let's say a watch geek that really digs uh, deep into some of these things, he potentially can have a bigger influence uh, then, I mean, his, his voice can be heard, whereas 10, I mean, 5, 10, 15 years ago, and that the, his voice would be heard by a very, very potential small uh, community. And this, uh, the bound, I mean, the frontiers today have just kind of exploded, and potentially he can reach out to a much wider uh, audience and have, therefore, a bigger impact on, uh, on, uh, on the industry. Yeah, but uh, you've been in the industry for like at least for 13 years. So what keeps your passion alive? It's the people. Uh, I've always liked watches for what they represent and uh, the intricacy. Uh, and uh, I mean, kind of this, uh, yeah, the, the mechanical magic uh, uh, around uh, uh, such a tiny and uh, incredible uh, uh, object. <laughs> But without people, I mean, these objects will not uh, exist. And uh, the fact of being lucky enough to go and visit so many uh, actors of this industry, whether it's brands, but also the suppliers, artisans, and see the passion and be able to share this enthusiasm uh, um, with our audience and ourselves, of course, is something that is uh, uh, very, very pleasing. And also, and something that I said a little bit before, the fact of even though things have been, practi I mean, practically everything has been invented, but nonetheless, we still see every time a new thing. I mean, I don't feel like I've repeated myself that many of, many times uh, over the last uh, 13 years uh, because there is a lot of creativity. Uh, sometimes it's just marketingly driven, uh, but other, some other times it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it uh, has more uh, uh, substance. And uh, um, so the fact of always keeping you know pushing uh, what one can do. I find that absolutely uh, fascinating. And now there's maybe a new ways of, I mean, conceiving a mechanical watch in itself with a different type of mechanical approaches or materials used. Uh, and, you know, I'd always take this example when talking about the, the, the big crown. Uh, you know, since I've been, I've been doing this, uh, I always hear, you know, each year, for instance, oh, they're coming out with new products, but each year people say, oh, but it's exactly the same and thing like that. But it, in the, it's in the imperceived uh, details that, I mean, I know that they keep pushing to make things always better and better and better. Even if it's, you know, just to go and scratch and get this one little 1% uh, uh, of uh, improvement, uh, they, some people will, uh, will, will, will do that. And I think that's, that, that's quite cool. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, fascinated by the, the, the creativity. And uh, also this notion of, in French, we say bien facture. Uh, it means that 
you know, people, they really want to do their job as to, to the best capacity, capabilities. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of personal commitment by all the people that are working within this industry. Uh, I'm talking the guys that are really doing the, the products. The, the, uh, and uh, this is something I simply have respect for, and I'm happy to be able to showcase it as much as possible uh, with what we do. Well, now we can maybe talk about uh, more personal aspects. What are the three most important aspects or features uh, of a watch for you? Well, proper functioning is pretty good, I would say, to start up with. That's the first one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just, you know, the... Uh, so, yeah, there's the, the, the fact of not, you know, of not doing things just to uh, create a buzz, for instance, but uh, then, you know, things need to be, you know, seriously done and be sturdy and be chronometrically, chronometrically uh, uh, sound. Uh, this is uh, indeed something that is uh, important. Uh, so, I mean, I answered a little bit and this, uh, this so I'm... Uh, this point, getting, yeah. Huh? So this is the first point? First point, yeah, but then, uh, so... Uh, I, uh, <laughs> well, like I said, continue to be surprised. Uh, that that that's a nice thing. And on a personal level, for me, is uh, I mean, the more I go on, the more I'm basically attracted to simplicity. Uh, and uh, yeah, so really go to the to the really the. the the purity of uh, of what a watch should do tell the time you know just the hours and minutes for me that's fine enough but still a refined simplicity i guess well but uh, i have respect for every type of watch as long as it's done indeed with some kind of sincerity so uh, i mean a 1000 swiss franc watch i could just be as uh, um, I can admire it as much as uh, maybe something a little bit more uh, complex. You know, as long as those uh, products or timepieces are done with some kind of uh, sincerity that is that is reflected in its price, then it's okay. Then I mean, of course, there are things that are a bit crazy because sometimes you have such a huge demand that. Uh, People are, or brands are capable of selling their pieces very, I mean, to crazy prices. But that's just reflects market and, uh, and the offer and demand. You know, I mean, if you do a parallel with the world of painting, I mean, the, 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 the material used to do a paint is going to cost you a couple of, you know, tens of uh, Swiss francs. Uh, but then that painting can be worth two million at the end. Okay, so and nobody's going to question. Oh, but it only costed uh, fifteen francs of painting. You know, it's just something else. The it's execution. the love that puts in, put inside. That is inside. Yeah, the execution and the love. Yeah. And yeah, and the, the the understanding uh, again of the of the of, of of the market in itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, collectors or purchasers, consumers, and uh, what the brand is capable of doing. But if you play too much on that side, you can, you could put yourself in a tricky situation. And we have example of that today. Now it's going to be a little bit more tricky with the questions. Uh, so the next question is, if you could only wear one watch for the rest of your life, which one would it be? That's obviously a complicated question, but those would be watches that of course, have a meaning uh, for me. And uh, I, I would say I have like a old um, uh, Breitling uh, that was used to be my father's and he gave it to me when I was a teenager. And uh, not, well, I like this watch because I think it looks cool, but uh, of course it has a little extra the feeling dimension to it so it's not a question of of uh, worth uh, in terms of monetary speaking i mean it's just a kind of more of an emotional uh, thing so it, but so this one is a, a chronomatic meaning it's uh, like a nice chrono and uh and like i said i like the the, the, the look of it and then another one uh, is a juvena that uh, belonged to my godfather 
was uh, very important uh, for me, and this is a simple, uh, indeed, uh, to uh, three hands watch, and uh, this is uh, this is just uh, this is just fine. So it's more about the personal relationship I have with this object than the object uh, by itself. Uh, the next question is: If you could meet and have dinner with one person from the watchmaking world, dead or alive, who would it be, and? Why? Uh, I would go with uh, John Harrison because I think there's this a bit of like uh, our world, our society, um, mankind almost, like a, a before and after uh, moment. It, it has a, it, this, his inventions um, has had such an influence on our development. Um, so it's kind of a, a pivotal moment. So we're talking about the uh, 18th uh, century, which was definitely, in my view, the, the most creative. Uh, and uh, here you can say, use maybe the word disruptive, but it, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's really a moment that uh, really changed our relation, sh relation to time uh, by bringing this, uh, the, this level of precision that he managed to establish in his uh, clocks, I mean, particularly uh, the marine chronometer, uh, with the impacts that this has, has on the, uh, like I said, evolution, development of our world, uh, trading, uh, going from one place to the other, and all the consequences that go behind. But I love the idea also that this guy, when you look at his, uh, well, let's say title, is, is um, the, the, the guy is a carpenter and watchmaker. So he's not a watchmaker portrayed. Okay, he was a real carpenter, and so the the fact of having I, I can imagine. I just would I would like to pick his brain because um, to, he must have been such an ingenious uh, person uh, and just well, basic but such such a genius uh, simply uh, that uh, yeah I would, I would like to understand more about his uh, personality. Uh, it must be quite interesting. It must. Be, I would like to ask him also if he perceived at that time, again, the, the consequences of uh, uh, what he uh, developed. Um, yeah, so yeah, it would be John Harrison. Yeah, so let's hope the time machine will be uh, invented soon enough <laughs> for us to be able to travel in time. Mm -hmm. So we have like just a couple of more questions left. Uh, mm -hmm. One is... Uh, there's one sentence uh, I would like you to complete. Looking back um, to your life, maybe more watchmaking professional life, mm -hmm. um, related to watchmaking, uh, what would you change if you would change anything? Well, not not much, I would say. Uh, I'm quite happy. Uh, I mean, of course, we could have taken different path. I mean, we could have also become more uh, kind of a watch dealers like so many other medias have become uh, but uh, today the fact of you know really focusing more on education we've always done that through watches tv but uh, to have this kind of new chapter uh, opening with uh, horopedia is for me obviously the, the something that is extremely satisfying it's putting a lot of pressure on our shoulders but I feel this kind of personal need of doing something that is indeed purposeful. Uh, so and maybe uh, it's a strive for new challenges. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, but it's also it's just like uh, I think we're in a very good position to drive such a project uh, because indeed we don't have s those other interests, you know. Uh, and uh, we let's hope, you know, just we can remain. Uh, objective and pure in our way of bringing things. We don't have any hidden agendas behind. It's just a question for us to document to the best possible way uh, the different crafts and competencies and so forth. I mean, it's it's ambitious project. I mean, so it's uh, it's not a, like a side little thing or whatsoever. No, it, we want it to be to become like a very meaningful uh, project for. For, for for future generations, uh, it's uh, it's very very important. So no, no 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 regrets. Um, I would have. I mean, sometimes I felt a little bit. I mean, I would like Watches TV to be sometimes a bit less associated uh, with me. I understand that I'm kind of the at the helm of this thing, and I'm kind of the, the visible part. But uh, ultimately, I would like to have 
people around and you know just so this is saying this is something I wanted to do already uh, from the start and when I started Watches TV I had also a colleague that I was uh, talking in front of the camera and that was cool uh, and now I hope to go back a little bit more in this position also because I don't I'll have less time available to to do so and uh, now looking towards the future what goals do you set for yourself maybe apart uh, from Oropedia because it's obvious that it's going to be like the it will take a huge part of your life now. But just to continue uh, having pleasure also with what we do. I mean, I, I feel very fortunate in being in such a position. Okay, I, I, I wanted it. Okay, it didn't happen just like that and it fell on top of me uh, uh, by chance. It's something that uh, we've created. Um, so yeah, just to feel. Uh, maintain the uh, enthusiasm and uh, this level of surprise, keeping to be in a position of that, to learn things all the time. Uh, so as long as this uh, dimension is still present, then I'm uh, looking forward for, for, for the future. And I know I won't be uh, disappointed because I, I mean, the industry has proven to me that it, it like I said before, is very, it's a creative one. And uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, being surprised. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming to our first podcast. Yeah, thank you for sharing all those great views on the industry and your more personal work. So that was it. Uh, thank you for being with us. See you soon and Viva, Viva Watch Waking! waking.